we we move to um, the next round of conversation. We've we've talked a lot. Uh, I, I would repeat again that since uh, June, when we even before the webinar uh, that I had uh, talking about what our thoughts were around next year, there's been a lot of work that's been going on uh, behind the scenes. The principals in June. Um, district office staff uh, in the month of July working around little brief bits of time that we've had opportunities to get off here and there. Uh, but um, the, the work continues and uh, we talked last week about the fact that we had done a, a community survey in, in uh, I think it was late May, June time frame, uh, but with kind of the evolution of the case growth and how things have kind of changed over the summer uh, there has been constant revisiting. I've shared that we've had weekly meetings with Clark County superintendents, um, having conversations about uh, uh, opening in the fall for all schools, because one of the things that we are doing, regardless of, of how we ultimately open, we are opening school. It's not a question of, are we having school or not? We're having school. It's just a question of how we're delivering instruction. Uh, and so for today, what uh, we're going to do is um, have a little more deep conversation because we've kind of identified quite a while ago the three potential models that there were, one being go back full time, two being go back in some sort of a hybrid, which could mean a couple days a week. It could mean, you know, full time in elementary and distance in second. I mean, there's all kinds of, uh, of, of iterations of what that could potentially look like. And then the third being uh, kind of a distance learning 2.0, the remote learning. We've seen um, in our state, uh, districts in the King County, Puget Sound area have already announced that they're going um, remote learning. My understanding is the, the only district in ESD 112 that's actually announced that so far or told their community is I think White Salmon might have done that up the gorge. I heard from my brother the other day. Um, I know that a lot of Clark County districts have been talking. I think that we're going to have some final decisions by the end of this week on this in terms of recommendations and, and where we're, what we're looking at. Um, ultimately, the board will pass a resolution at the meeting on August 11th. Um, Julie Tumblety uh, has been working with the template and, and we will present that to the board also as part of that process. But what we wanted to do tonight was kind of talk a little more in depth about what uh, a distance learning 2.0 would look like. Uh, regardless of whether we have kids on site, uh, 2.0, uh, the distance 2.0 is central to what we're doing uh, and would be an option for parents um, to start the year. And we've been talking about that for a while, but we wanted to talk a little bit more, a little bit more about that. And uh, I would also say that even if we do open remotely in a, in a distance uh, learning 2.0, uh, we, we still have the opportunities to bring in students in small groups because I think we can uh, bring them into school in groups up to five. And um, so we have to kind of continue to work in the month of August around that. Uh, we have all kinds of unique needs for students. And so we need to identify those unique needs. And we're certainly aware of many, but there's others that kind of, you know, they end up um, showing themselves over time that we need to try to kind of, uh, we need to serve those students as well. So uh, with all that being said, um, I see Julie grimacing at me kind of. Uh, so I will turn it over to Brian really quickly to kind of start the uh, introduction of 2.0. And again, throughout you have opportunities to ask questions and at the end we'll have opportunities to ask questions as well. All right, thank you, Mike. So we're, we have a PowerPoint put together and Julie will start it off. I just wanted to say a couple words. Erin Lusich was going to be here tonight, but she had I, she has an anniversary tonight, and she already had plans. So uh, she needs to get a lot of credit because curriculum instruction group has worked all summer diligently, really thinking about distance learning, hybrid, and hybrid, what it's going to look like, and how we could get a lot better, how we could learn from the spring. And so there's, we, she's done a great great deal of work with that. And she couldn't be here tonight, so then we're just going to work through uh, some slides and then. Probably at the end there could be questions or slide by slide, whatever works for everybody. So Julie, you gonna start us off? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, I am going to share my screen so that you can see the PowerPoint.
starting on slide, slide one. So I just want to reiterate what Brian said. Um, starting back in May and June, the curriculum instruction department has been learning from everything that we did in the spring and the feedback that we got. And so this has been in the works of just thinking about what remote looks like, knowing that Regardless, we will have families that need remote learning. So whether our schools are open part-time in person, full-time in person, we will still have the need for remote learning. So the CNI department has been working all summer thinking about the best way to reach our students. Um, we've been going on some guiding principles about what we believe in and why we think um, schools should open and just thinking about the health and safety of our students are the first priority providing access to curriculum in an equitable manner, ensure every student has a meaningful connection to a responsible adult, and gathering input from stakeholders. So thinking about those, just reviewing what Mike already said was, we sent out a number of surveys, which seem like years ago now, June doesn't even seem like it was in the same year, having that um, community me meeting with Mike on Zoom, um, but what we had was more than 15,000 responses on those surveys, and we were asked, and the takeaways were to think innovatively about fall instruction, provide access to all of the curriculum as well as non-academic needs, um, follow health and safety, and communicate regularly. So understanding what the needs are of our community really, um, we got a lot of good feedback from those. So we're thinking about what August looks like. And even as we're still meeting in Zoom, we know that for the next couple of weeks that in-person activities are gonna be limited to small group and mostly virtual. While we have a really good model for 2.0, there's a lot once we decide that remote, if we decide that remote is how we're gonna start, then there are some pieces that we can instantly start putting into place. In the next two weeks of August, we still have teachers coming in to plan. We have administrators coming in for professional development with the courageous conversations. We still are able to do those things. We've just moved most of it to virtual. And then we will be doing some smaller limited groups and thinking about supply pickup, Chromebook pickup, book pickup. So that will be happening as well as student orientations in August, freshman orientations, sixth grade orientations, all those big transitions are gonna happen. They're just gonna happen virtually. And those um, school teams have been working again all summer thinking about how they can still provide an experience for those students just starting high school or just starting sixth grade and get, um, get acquainted with school staff and other students. So those are still happening. And then we wanna reiterate what was said was that school's starting. School starting September 1st. We will think about students engaging with curriculum. We're going to have a strong start. And then also how to do get to know you activities and learning expectations virtually. So those are all part of the plan. All right. So the main things we have learned from remote learning are that we need to find, sorry, every time I move your faces, it takes part of my screen. So I'm trying to figure out where I can move you to. Okay, um, we need to find more consistent ways and means of delivering teaching with specific and limited platforms and applications. There was too many platforms people were using, too many applications, teachers and parents couldn't keep up. There needs to be multiple ways for students to participate, both through online tools as well as tangible paper product tools. We need clearer expectations for students with embedded supports and accountabilities and consistent methods of providing feedback to students and families. So that's what we got from the feedback earlier and that's what we built the um, remote learning 2.0 off of. So then Aaron's team, again, they've looked at a bunch of different areas. One of the biggest areas they've been working on is content and curriculum. We cannot do all of the learning that we would do in person in a remote space. So we're planning for about 80% of that content. 
So we are modifying, they're modifying the scope and sequences to provide, prioritize learning, specify the core resources that are really needed, share expectations of delivery, or sorry, specify expectations of delivery in a teaching in a remote context. So what does it look like when we're delivering content? Um, and we'll also include in the models, there are expectations for community relationships, building routines, and social emotional learning. So Aaron's team has created these scope and sequences with specific models that include all of those pieces. So teachers have something specific that they can use as an exemplar. We're also going with Google Classroom next year. What's really helpful with this is it's a one-stop shop for all the links to teaching, lessons, resources, supports. We'll have everything in there and then it goes right to the grading app. Um, so teachers have a little bit less work to do in terms of having to move their information over to Skyward. One of the other things we learned from spring was that um, teachers creating on their own, one, was really difficult, and two, created very different experiences for students at the same level in the same grade. Specifically, like I have twin first graders who had very different expectations. So what we would like for the fall and moving forward is just a real big focus on team utilization. So we need alignment at the team level. They're gonna share preparation and link it to modified scope and sequences. So they are working together at the team level to create their work and their lessons. Their shared design of daily teaching, whole group, small group, individual. They're gonna prepare for ongoing and timely feedback and communication and provisioning for access with students with unique needs. The other thing that makes this really helpful is if a team member gets sick, that means the curriculum doesn't stop, the work doesn't stop, the team would be there to pick up the pieces. And then the team design is personalized to meet the needs of each classroom. So within that, there's gonna be consistent week at a glance formats for students and families that we're gonna post on the family website. So again, we need to communicate, which is what we heard from the community, we need to communicate clearly what the expectations are for families. Our families are our learning partners in this. And so we need the learning partner to understand what is expected of the students daily. Another area is engagement. So we wanna engage families in the website, again, what I just referenced, but that in the website that they're gonna see what is expected of the week in whether it's elementary, middle, high school. And then also we're going to help them see the resources, tutorials. Um, a lot of parents have called and said, we need professional development on how to use this, or we are not sure how to access Google sites. So on the family facing websites, there will be short videos, tutorials, professional development really for our learning partners, which are the families. Um, another big learning from the spring was attendance and engagement of students. We are enacting student engagement teams, which will be at the school level, administrators, counselors, deans, they will work together to look at student engagement. So spring was hard as um, at different levels, grades were frozen, engagement wavered depending on the student. Um, it's starting fresh now, grading starts fresh, grading's back to a more traditional look. So students need to not only engage in the curriculum, but are they attending their Google Meets? Are they showing up to class? Um, so we'll be looking at attendance and engagement data that was reported by teachers. And then they're gonna work together to find out what's going on. So we know that there's usually not a simple answer so those um, student engagement teams will dig in to the reason why students are engaging or not, and then try to find the resource to help them engage. We also learned from the spring that we need a way to get supplies to students. So we're looking at figuring out how to get access to supplies to students. And that includes the hands-on learning. So we're thinking about whether we can provide materials at home, 
kits of materials. Um, I was talking to Susan Dixon and Justin Birmingham, our new CTE director, and thinking about what does CTE look like? And they've been looking into a ton of different things, including augmented reality, virtual reality, different simulations for anatomy and physiology. They had um, a wide range of things that they're able to push out to students. And then going to what Mike said, small groups in building, just really evaluating how we can get some small groups in to either um, get what they need. So if it's academic needs, they need to talk to the teacher, whether it's counseling needs, they need to talk to a counselor. So what do we need to do to get students in building in small groups? Okay, and then Clarissa is gonna talk. You're muted. Under, need to unmute. There we go. There we go. Yep. We good now? Yep. <laughs> okay. I apologize. Um, so uh, we will continue again to serve our students with unique needs. Um, there was a lot of learning that happened um, again in the past as to what um, what strategies worked best uh, for our students with unique needs. So what we'll do is, and what we would do in, in any of those situations is, is as we have, as you have heard Julie talk about how the um, 2.0 has been updated and, and beefed up and is more rigorous. We will allow our students to interact with the new 2.0 and track their engagement, their progress, their success, um, and then use that information to then attempt to augment and change and provide additional supports as needed. Um, the, let me move this over so I can make sure I talk. Um, and, and these students obviously are including, we're talking about our students on IEP, our ELLs, um, and what we, what we want to stay away from is assuming, if you will, that every student who is an ELL or every student who's on, on an IEP um, needs this a top level of support where we have to, you know, even consider you know, bringing them in in these small groups of five. What we want to do is allow them to interact with and engage with what we have um, and then track and see what is working for them and what is not and then providing for them that individualized experience um, as we can. And we do have Jay um, with us who might want to add some additional thoughts on serving students with unique needs. So, yeah, sure, appreciate that. Um, so as um, we look at serving students with IEP uh, needs in a uh, uh, remote environment, uh, I think the biggest thing, in addition to everything Julie had identified with consistency and platforms uh, and more, uh, I guess, parent and family friendly um, resources um, to be able to access, um, we will be working with the families uh, you, that directly uh, and we're committed to providing services and able the kids to engage in the remote learning. Um, and then in addition to that, as an IEP team, we will be identifying for kids that require more individualized or intensive supports, um, a variety of ways that we could um, support them differently or better. Um, in addition to potentially doing some in-person services, as long as um, the various requirements uh, related to uh, health and safety and PPE can be met in those environments. We, we will go, for, go forward and do that. Um, I think the biggest thing to remember is that special education is reflective of the general education program and is designed to enable students to access it. And so um, the biggest difference from what we did in the spring to this point forward will be the things I identified. In addition to that, IEPs will be what's implemented and not the continuous learning plans. So continuous learning plans were something the state put in place um, when we were, had the interrupted year, which identified that we were fully aware that we weren't fully implementing plans. But it, as we move forward, we will be implementing plans as written and or meeting as teams to revise them. Thank you, Jay. 
All right, a big area that we've gotten a lot of questions on also is around technology. So Brian, we'll talk a little bit about our plan. So if you if you remember where we left off last year, last at the end of the school year, every student had a Chromebook. We decided to let them keep them. Um, and so the we're starting at a little bit different space as far as Chromebooks, but we know thinking about the fall, we need to be right away that they ha have them. We know some students might, the Chromebook either might be broken or they lost their cord or it's not working. So we're putting a plan together IT as far as how to connect with kids quickly to have them and make sure they're working. And then new students as well to get them their Chromebooks. Another piece is just hotspots. I think I mentioned before, but we have now uh, over 400 hotspots in the district. But we know that as far as 2.0, 1.0, we had some hotspots. But then watching IT from an IT perspective, they weren't used as much as we would have liked. Some families used them a lot and others weren't used. We think that's a support issue. We need to make sure families understand how to use them, how it works, and just work with them until they're, it's seamless. So that's another area that we, we're right away. We know we need to start working on that right away and are working on plans to make that happen. Uh, one of the things that's been great about curriculum instruction, they have really worked well with IT and they've told us that we needed to really beef up Google Classroom. So that has happened. So one of the things we've mentioned a couple times, grades now are seamless. Before teachers had to do two sets of grades for secondary. Now, if you put a grade in Google Classroom, it will automatically be in Skyward, which helps the teacher a great deal. It also helps the student and the parent because uh, as a system, we're, using, we're used to using Skyward to get feedback and know what's going on. Uh, another thing that we purchased as a district for K-12 is Pear Deck. It's simply, it integrates with Google Classroom and it allows for major, to measure engagement, student engagement through a lot of different ways. So again, curriculum instruction, we work in K-12 to help families figure that, help teachers figure out how to use that. And as was mentioned before, we're going to go Google Classroom K-12, so that will be our platform. And we're going to go Google Meets, another thing that we beefed up. We now have all the different bells and whistles that Google Meets has. And with students having Chromebooks and then teachers having Chromebooks, it, that should be more effective. It also should be nicer for parents, so you're not sometimes on, one student's on Zoom, one, one student's on Meets. And uh, I think the big picture is we have a lot better understanding of what we need to do to support with the technology and that we have, we're gonna be able to get that started right away. Our goal is that they have those tools for the very first day that there's not a month lapse if you're a brand new student. So we have some areas that are challenges, but we, we have to address those. All right, thank you. Um, and then we know all of this comes with a lot of professional development. Our teachers and students were thrown into a virtual environment in the spring with really little to no professional development. We got them things as we were able to throughout the spring, but that's going to be a big focus of our August work is that um, one, our teacher professional development, they're gonna see and have access to learn how to use all the tools that curriculum instruction has been put in place. They are gonna have much clearer expectations about what is needed from them on a weekly basis in order to serve students. They'll get professional development on the new tech tools that Brian was mentioning. And we're going to give them PD on how to utilize these two-week plans that CNI has put together. So that's going to be a big push of the teacher professional development in a couple of weeks. And then also just reiterating the parent PD that I mentioned earlier that we need to get parents access to what we're teaching. And so how to get the tech tools and then um, troubleshooting for them also when inevitably something happens at home. And that is it for the presentation. So I'm gonna stop sharing screen and we have time for questions. I have a question on the um, time. So like, I don't really know how 1.0 went, like, um, so, you know, our typical school day is like, what, nine to three or whatever, five, six hours of instruction time. Mm -hmm. How much in the spring do you think that it was actual teacher, student contact um, um, through, you know, just instruction? And then how much do we expect in 2.0? 
So we are building a schedule that meets the 1,027 hours, um, but that's not going to be synchronous. That's all not going to be synchronous. We will have time that it's asynchronous. Teachers will be expected to have live sessions weekly. And then there's going to be a lot of pre-recorded videos and pieces that students can watch at their own pace. Because we also know when students are at home, their lives can differ very, very about what they can access and when. Mm -hmm. um, so really, it's going to be just a combination. And last year, there was a lot of variance in one teacher would hold one 30 minute class and one teacher would hold an hour class daily. So that's something we're still working out into what the expectations are for live sessions. And then the asynchronous where it can be more recorded, a mini lesson. And then what is the expectation? So one thing CNI has done is what do you do in a live session? If we get these kids in front of us, what are we doing with them? And so trying to teach teachers the tools and the tricks of how do you have an opening ritual? What do you do when you bring the kids in? And then where's the mini lesson? And then you break them out. And then a mini lesson and you pull them in and break them out. So that's all in the work that CNI is doing of what a, what a lesson looks like virtually and what's best practice around that. But the specific time, there will be live sessions. There's going to be work time. That All that's going to be built into a schedule that we have to submit to the state as well. I think we have to approve the submission too. Sorry, Julie. Go ahead. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Ron. Oh, okay. Um, you talked at the beginning about. Um, I'm just looking at notes that I took up here. Um, training teachers um, to work as a team and, and aligning things at the team level with uh, best practices and so forth. How are substitute teachers um, going to be looped into that when they're needed? That's really a, the hybrid portion of substitute teaching. I don't know what substitute teaching will look like if we're fully remote. So I really believe that's something we'll look at in the next couple of weeks. But just like we have when we have, you know, we're doing the one right now. And then as we think we've thought about hybrid, but substitute teachers coming in, we'll leave lesson plans because they would be doing the in-person portion while depending on the illness of the person would be doing the virtual, but we'd have to train them if they end up taking over an entire class. How are they going to take attendance? What form does that take? So Clarissa and her team have just been talking about that today. So you're in the preliminary discussions about that? Sorry, Clarissa, go ahead, please. We are, we, yes, this is a great question. Um, we were talking about um, defining attendance uh, versus participation, um, and we're working on that, but then also ways in which it's a more streamlined process for teachers. So if we're using Google Classroom, is there a way to build in an attendance mechanism within that, um, or can they do it through uh, Skyrim, which they have already been using? But yes, that is a conversation that we're having because we, I mean, one, we, we've got to prove that we're doing that in our plan that we're submitting. Um, but beyond that, we want to make sure we can use that attendance slash participation data to provide for the student engagement team so that they can um, uh, better support students who we find are not engaging um, like we'd like. Right. Mm -hmm. um, what about things like a science lab? I try to imagine a remote learning chemistry lab, for example. Has there been thought given to what is possible there? So yeah, that's where the, again, CTE and the curriculum department, Crystal Wolf is our science specialist. They've been looking at what sort of virtual realities you can do with science labs, what's the augmented reality or simulation. So there are a lot out there. We just have to access it and then get it to the teachers. So they're working on that. And there's always been time in the semester before the first big lab. So mm -hmm. we have time. Um, and that might be a case where we can bring in some students. So if we can't find a good substitution, when can we bring in kids to do that? You know, what sorts of things and pieces do we need students in the building for? Okay. Um, what was, uh, was there anything in, in, I guess, remote learning 1.0, either in the, in the instructional things or in the, um, how do I put this? in the accommodative 
I guess, approaches to things like you have students who would go to some speech therapy or have some extra language instruction and stuff. Was there anything about distance learning that improved circumstances for, for those kids or was possible? For example, I heard about speech therapists still being able to do their therapy over a Zoom meeting. Um, could you talk a little bit more about, I guess, success stories or um, innovative yeah, yeah, type I mean, things? Yeah, we had quite a few students actually um, when I spoke with their parents uh, who um, had more success in the, in the remote learning environment than they were having in the classroom environment um, for, for a variety of reasons. And it was, you know, it's dependent upon whatever it was about the classroom experience that caused difficulties for them. But um, either way, it was, it was, it was more productive. Um, uh, we had, you know, one positive, uh, we had a higher participation rate in IEP meetings than we have ever had uh, uh, with using the remote uh, meeting process, um, which is awesome because the whole IEP process is a collaboration between the family and the school. And when, when people are participating, um, it just, it makes the process better. So um, that, so, I mean, those are two huge positives that I see uh, continuing on in, into this, the next year. Uh, speech therapies, um, they, I, I didn't, that was a service that I believe um, was implemented um, successfully in a remote manner as it is in person. The, play, the, the part that becomes a little bit harder with like speech therapies is when you're doing like group work around social skills in a, in a, in a, in a Zoom environment. Um, but, you know, we, we've learned a lot um, and uh, we'll continue to move forward in, in supporting kids. Uh, and, and when we need to, we'll intensify services. So. How do you spell Pear Deck? <laughs> Pear, P-E-A-R-D-E-C-K. Thanks. Uh, let's see. And I guess, I guess it's worth asking that you're aware that uh, I guess OSPI loosened the rules about instructional time to include uh, the asynchronous element. Um, and so I was happy to hear that that's in the planning. And I'm very curious to see what my son's secondary schedule is going to look like because he's very curious as well. Um, but thank you for bringing all this information to us. Superintendent Reichdahl had a call this afternoon, and that was one of the things that he talked about was uh, that, uh, which was a pretty significant issue. How are they going to look at hours and, and waivers and how are they going to deal with that? Uh, I, I would, you know, like from my perspective, the work that's gone into building what has been built to this point is significant. Uh, obviously, we aren't a system, or this, the, we don't have systems that have been built in remote learning, um, but I do think that they've done a tremendous job uh, Brian, his team, Aaron, I know she's uh, not participating. She's been very instrumental in that. Bill and Scott and, and Jay and others, uh, everybody's really been involved in the conversations. Uh, but even with all that said, literally every day something changes. And so it's still, uh, uh, we're getting to the point where uh, this path is is kind of becoming more solidified. And I think I said it earlier, I think by the end of this week, um, we're, we're gonna have uh, information and announcement on this. Um, but we've, we've just got a lot of challenges as we move forward um, with how many kids end up enrolling and, and what options we have ahead. So I feel like every day we think, well, this is a tough decision, we make the decision, but Every day there's another difficult decision that's in front of us. And uh, I would be, um, it, it wouldn't be in my mind, I know we're talking about distance learning 2.0, but I, I always want to make sure that everybody remembers that the state's facing an almost $9 billion shortfall. Uh, when they came out with that information, there was about 36 months to address it. Um, the legislature hasn't done anything from the perspective of having any kind of a special session call to start addressing it which means really the earliest they'll have an opportunity to start looking at this is when you get to January. 
Um, and so it, it even shrinks further the uh, months that they have to address the situation. So um, we've got a lot of work still ahead of us. Our jobs, as we said from the beginning, our jobs to teach kids, keep them safe. And that goes as uh, with the staff too. So uh, certainly the, the hope was we would be able to have kids on site. Uh, everyone knows kids in school is the number one priority. Uh, at the same time, we have to be able to do that in a safe manner for both the students and for our staff. Uh, all this being said, we're talking tonight about 2.0 distance learning. Our kids will come back at some point. They are going to come back, uh, whether we go distance learning or, or we don't go. They're, they're going to be in our schools and we continue to work on those models as well. And what would that look like? And what do we need to have in place to make sure everybody's feeling safe and comfortable? We're working, I think, more with the Department of Health uh, as the summer's gone on. Uh, getting better ideas around the metrics and and uh, how some of these hybrid models might look and how what the full model might look like. And you hear the the folks at the federal level and they would say at the state level as well, opening schools to kids in the current situation, um, it is going to be uh, a costly thing at whatever point in time because there's going to be different expectations around the PPE, around the cleaning. And all those things have to happen. So it's, it's uh, uh, public education has, uh, honestly, we face a lot of difficulties um, on a daily basis. This is just another challenge. I see we've got something like 75 people listening in today. Uh, they represent parents and staff that are very interested, very, um, you know, want to do what's best for kids and, uh, in this day and age, it's like feels like almost everything we do. There's a certain percentage of kids, folks that think this is the way we take care of kids and best prepare. Then there's another group that thinks this is the way we do it. So it's a very divided country. Our priority always is in in uh, teaching our students the best way we possibly can in a safe manner, and that's ultimately what we will be doing in Evergreen. I had a question regarding social emotional learning. Um, I, I was thinking, I'm so I was so happy to see about the the tutorials for parents because that was something I was going to ask about because I know a lot of people feel not confident about assisting their student um, through this. So having some some things that they could learn, I got to think, and maybe our um, um, coaches, our teacher coaches could be some of assistance in there. But on the social emotional learning side, I, um, I know there's so many classrooms that have really um, developed a great practice of community circles and getting that start of the day to be meaningful and and then I think about, you know, a lot of the work that Carl Smith has done with the, you know, with the meditations and the different kinds of um, mindfulness curriculum. And I, I could see us, and I could, I think some of the parents could use some of that mindfulness to get them through all of this and, and mm -hmm. the emotion that we're having going through this crisis. Um, so what's the plan there on the social emotional side? So our students social emotional health is really um, a big priority for us in this that's not just content right we don't just teach kids content but um, we need to reach the whole child so all of the plans have been worked on in conjunction with um, Carl and a few of our other um, team members that work with curriculum instruction, social emotional team, and thinking about how do you start those welcoming rituals in your classroom when you don't get the kids in a circle? How do you build mm -hmm. those relationships with the kids when you're doing it virtually? So those are all pieces of professional development that are gonna go out to teachers because we know the ones that were most successful in the spring were also the ones that had those strong relationships with kids the kids had strong relationships with each other in the class. So they wanted to show up, they want to be there. So those are pieces that we're going to push out the professional development because so much of it is, Oh, well they show up 
And then I built that where we need to figure out, okay, they show up virtually now. How are we going to build that? How do we get to know each other in a virtual environment? So there is a number of on these documents, um, there's one that I looked at recently that we're giving to teachers that included 40 opening strategies, 40 closing strategies, and those are just getting to know you pieces. So how do we do that over virtual learning? And so pushing that out to teachers and then teaching them how do you plan a day and include that. And that's part of thinking about like what's important live, what lives live and what lives asynchronous. And the social emotional is a big piece that lives live because that's when we can see your faces. We see each other smiling. You get, you get that interaction where you don't necessarily get it asynchronous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I particularly worry because there's been a lot of discussion regarding the disadvantage of online distance learning for the um, emotional health of students and the increase in things like maybe like suicide and um, other, you know, really serious impacts that this can have on our kids. And so I'm glad to hear that you're integrating that all into what you're thinking about. And I know that'll evolve as we think about this more, because um, I do worry, you know, about our kids that need somebody extra to help them through some tough times. We agree. So I have a question about the small groups coming to buildings um, to do certain projects or certain things. How are we envisioning that they're getting transported there? Is this just kids whose caregivers or parents can take them? Do we have transportation ability? So, like for me, um, we have to look at how we can transport. I mean, we obviously we, we wouldn't provide that without having a solution where we could actually uh, provide opportunities for kids to get to school by using our buses. So I would imagine it would be a combination of those things. Uh, you know, it could be parents. It could be kids that are close enough to walk. It could be that we're running routes. Um, there, you, you know, that the, you've heard Superintendent Rechtal talk a lot about the, their funding, you know, the state's funding, everything. The, the one area that there is a lot of question about is transportation uh, because nobody really understands how the transportation funding works in our system in the state. Uh, and I think when you even ask OSPI, they have a difficult time really uh, explaining how the system works. So uh, the, the, but what we do know is that there's kind of three points in the year, uh, a fall count, there's a winter count, and there's a spring count. That information gets plugged into some sort of a, uh, they actually call it a black box, as well as like area miles in a district and how many riders there are and how many destinations. And it spits out a number that somehow kind of normalizes what they think you should be spending. Um, any district that goes remote in the fall, arguably, unless there's some change in law is losing one of those three counts. So there's an impact on funding. Um, that's not something I'm sure the legislature ever anticipated. So we have been thinking about, you know, how can we potentially use our buses creatively um, to generate funding? This would be an option of that. Uh, 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 but one of the ways we were able to use our, our buses in the spring um, and our drivers uh, were able to participate was by delivering meals. The funding formula doesn't work on funding or on transporting meals. It works on transporting kids. And so we have to come up with some sort of creative solution that might allow us to do that and try to leverage the, the formula in a way that helps um, support that. But, but we wouldn't come up with any plan that would say, okay, it's all on the kids that have the ability to get to school because their parents are with them or, because, you know, we, we have to make sure it's equitable, whatever we deliver and have an opportunity for uh, um, our transportation system to pick kids up. At, at the same time, um, we have to be thoughtful about um, the distancing even on buses. The guidelines really didn't kind of, I mean, they talked about a lot of uh, social distancing in the classroom, but they felt with open windows and things like that, we could, we could do some um, more transportation on our buses. We still have to think about that. If it's hard to have kids in a social distance 
situation in the school. Um, we're concerned about cases. I don't think we want to get a bunch of kids on the buses, but we're still trying to think of creative ways um, even to get kids to school, maybe to get their meals and, and seeing whether or not that makes sense to deliver kids to schools. Uh, they have provided a continuance of some of the waivers that we were able to use for feeding kids in the spring. One of those being that you could serve multiple meals at any one time. So if, if you have a student show up at the school, whether we brought them there or whether their parents brought them there or they walked there, um, we could deliver five meals to them for the rest of the week. So we're, we're, we still have, uh, we still got a month to come up with some pretty creative solutions to try to maintain as much funding as we can and, and uh, uh, work through that. Have we can, are, are there any plans to connect with our daycare providers? Um, because some of the students may be going to daycare, whether yeah. it be the in-home or the different centers. And um, how, yeah, I mean, how I think that there's conversations, there's conversations about that. There's conversations, um, I think uh, maybe Julie, because I think we likely will do, we're going to be doing surveys kind of throughout the month of August as well. And an anticipated one would be reaching out to parents with respect to the needs that would help inform potentially um, even the ESC, the SWIC system that we've had, that we've partnered with. They've been primarily a birth, uh, excuse me, a before and after care, um, but we may have opportunities with the proper protocols in place to be able to have kids in um, run through their system. But yeah, we're, we're working with folks on that, absolutely. And also, uh, uh, you know how I get these text messages in the middle? I talk a long time, and I talk so long, at times people text me while I'm talking to help me out. Uh, Gail just sent a text that uh, also working with Parks and Rec and the Y on partnerships around daycare, child care. Well, even, it might even be like partnerships with tutoring. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you know parents need some assistance helping their kids or... I mean, there's different things that we might be able to engage with the community about. Agree. Well, I know from some of my statewide um, meetings, virtual meetings, uh, that there's been talk about whether or not to divert basic ed funding to daycare centers who have opened up spaces for distance learning and, and that kind of thing. So whatever form this takes, we're gonna have to pay attention um, and be advocating um, to make sure, as you said, that the, the formulas don't cost us um, the resources that we need to serve kids. We all know it's gonna be more expensive and that there isn't any additional money coming. Right. Yeah. So <clears throat> there'll be that whenever they start, but um, probably also need to, I would guess, um, have the conversations with legislators that I, I think you're already having, um, but also with the rule makers uh, so that the uh, waivers and the exceptions can take a form that we can afford. I just yeah, my mind listening to you talk about it. Yeah, we definitely are having conversations with uh, anyone that will allow conversations. Um, Myself, I'm just a touch skeptical of re-diverting basic ed funds for something else because I think, uh, I think if there's any savings, the, the legislators will be uh, inclined to take those savings as a way to offset the, the state's deficit. Um, I think there's talk of additional stimulus money that might come from the feds specifically for schools. I would anticipate if that comes to our state that it gets swallowed up by the shortfall somehow. Uh, I don't see that as new. I mean, we did get the first allocation, uh, which has been helpful, uh, no question. Um, I kind of, the, the what we heard from the legislature with that was that the likelihood is any additional funds that would come in the future would help with the shortfall. So, you know, we just keep trying to share our story and see if we can get anybody to listen. Any other questions from anyone? 
Could we have uh, copies of the slide decks that you presented? Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. I, Julie, I also, I, well, I wanted to just say that um, because I know that in the spring, like, uh, like we heard and what Victoria said about the social emotional learning, um, it's so important that we build relationships right from the beginning and kids so look forward to meeting their teacher, you know, the young ones and knowing, you know, what's going to happen and the classmates, all of that. And so we've got to try to create that even if it's virtual. And I don't know if we can, you know, meet the teacher like one-on-one -on -one, if that's possible. Um, but just something that these kids, you know, feel secure in that relationship with the teacher and the other people on their um, Zoom classroom, I guess, if that's the way we're, we're gonna have to go for a while. And then hold out hope that we can get back in the classroom and at some point. Uh, and part of my hope is that some of the things we all had to innovate around can be retained. Uh, it's like Jay said, some students did better. And if we can have an online offering um, that serves them, even as we get most of the kids back into the school and the sports and, and the activities that we all want, uh, especially music. We haven't really talked about that, but except to say you had, that Corinne was talking about it, uh, that those few who can't or, or who thrive in, in a distant situation get that opportunity um, as much well, as possible. Were all of our IEP meetings before in person? Did they all happen in person? They did? Uh, so, most of them, very rarely was there an alternative. Uh, most, we had 99%, 99.9% were in person before. And now they're more well attended because they're all virtual. So, uh, it, I mean, uh, that makes sense to continue that way because people are rushing around all the time, you know, trying to get from work to get to the school on time to, you know, kind of meet the schedules. And when you're virtual, you can sometimes, you know, meet at people's convenience. So, that might be something that we continue to. We have 70 people attending this meeting. We usually don't get that at a board workshop. So that's actually pretty cool to me. Mm -hmm. People get to look on and see this. So yeah, I want them, I, I would love to return to open school and all of the programs and things, but I think there are some innovations that we should be watching out to keep. Um, and I hope that the technology, I guess the pressure to do technology is, is uh, helping us accomplish things that I know that we've been talking about for years and years. At least I am. I really like it when technology serves. Yeah, I anticipate a lot of the things that are occurring now, whether it's through the meetings we have, the professional development we have, the work with kids, some of the technology around that, it, 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 we absolutely will adopt new norms. I'm certain of that as we move forward and, and folks are more comfortable with them as well. I mean, it's, it, we have to learn and take advantage of the things that work well and then, and then uh, um, kind of refine everything we do and make sure that whatever changes we make, you know, start limiting the things that we feel like haven't worked as well. Uh, one of the things that we plan on doing uh, like I said, the, the board will be passing a resolution at the meeting on the 11th, uh, as well as the plan. It's our requirement to have that done two weeks before uh, school uh, is su supposed to start. Um, at, at the um, same time, I anticipate this week with an announcement of what we're thinking for next year. And I think once we do that, one of the things you kind of alluded to a little bit, Rob, was music and there's questions about athletics and there's qu so I, I think a new uh, method of uh, 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 of communication that you'll see is I think we'll still be sending out letters and we'll be sending out emails and posting things but I think we're going to start videotaping kind of short messages that we can post so that folks can see that there might be uh, kale with one on WIA how does that impact Evergreen uh, from uh, uh, Corinne Ormson that may have what does what does learning in the fine arts look like to us in a in a remote learning environment and and honestly whatever we may encounter because certainly we want to continue to have questions coming in and be able to respond to those questions 
as often as we can. And I think a lot of times people have a few minutes to watch a video. It's easier for them to do that than to read a, um, a, a longer message that might be, that might come out or they have opportunities to do both of those things. So I, I feel like our, our uh, communication will be kind of supercharged as well. I know uh, Brian Gale have worked on, on a lot of that with Gale staff. And so we're looking forward to some of those things happening this week and beyond as well. Now, the quicker we can get the information out to people, it will be helpful for them in their planning for what they're going to do on their end. Yeah, I think what we had originally talked about was uh, was having kind of a, uh, you know, an, an, I wouldn't say just basically letting people know what the thought was the week of the third. I believe we'll probably get something out on that this week. So I think we'll be able to beat that. And then um, answer as many questions. We're already working on anticipating all the questions that folks are going to have and um, being able to share that information as we continue to move forward. Mike, do you know, are we planning on having, you know, a lot of school districts I've seen are kind of saying no in-person school until at least November 1st, whatever. Are we planning on having a potential end date in our announcement? I think what we've talked about is really kind of working with uh, the public health department. I, I don't see us saying uh, we're going to be doing this for the first semester or something like that. I still, I, I mean, I, I think in conversations with the health department, if we announce remote, the likelihood is uh, that it probably is a few months um, just from the perspective of the cases and, and the reasoning behind it. Uh, but I don't think we want to get locked into saying it's going to be for X amount of time uh, because our, our, you know, we, we want our kids and I know our parents and our students want to be, uh, on campus as soon as they possibly can with feeling, you know, with the safe, with the right safety precautions in place and with the right trends in the community. So um, I, I would anticipate uh, there probably will be a, an, a period of time, but it's, I don't see it being, it's going to be for the first semester or something like that. Because oh, Portland Public just about, announced, sorry. We, we can talk about how we're using the, county phase that we're in like right now we're in phase two to kind of direct the direction that we'll be heading as we evolve through this yeah i think as as long as the one th issue with the phases that we've seen even in the last week is it seems that the phases are changing i mean they're changing i, I don't know that they're necessarily but the kind of the, the guidelines and the the you know what it means to be in phase one or phase two um i think there was a lot of thought around that and i still think a lot of the metrics that might uh, inform the phases will be part of the uh, be part of the ultimate conversation. Well, what, but the bottom line is we just need to see that where where we are today because of the increase in cases. And so there's going to need to be either some new breakthrough in terms of science of understanding what's happening, or or just a, a decline in the cases that we've seen. Um, we we like I said, we want our kids on campus as quickly as possible, but we got to do it the right way. I just noticed Portland Public uh, announced specific dates until at least November 5th. Yeah, I think I saw that. Learning. Then, uh, a couple hours ago, they put that out, I think. I don't, I, I, people should probably be aware that it's a different governor and therefore a different set of rules in Oregon than, than here, and we've got to follow the rules that we're given. But uh, also, just as strongly as we possibly can put it, is that we're not going to put our employees, our children, or their parents or grandparents uh, in any danger that we can avoid due to the pandemic. And we're going to do this, as you said, so kids remain safe and their families remain safe. We're not going to make a rash decision based on any ideology other than their safety. Um, I don't know how else to put it. It's, as you said, the... Um, the ground keeps shifting under our feet when they change the rules from 50 to 10 for phase three and uh, you know, whatever else have, but we've got to do this is my sense just so that we help the health department control the disease. Agree. Yeah. 
just had to emote for a bit. All right, do we have anything else? Well, not from my end. Okay, Thank are we meeting everyone. next week? Thank you. Do we? So we, we, we um, that's what we need to talk about that. So maybe we can, I mean, we have one scheduled. We've had a, a planning meeting scheduled every Tuesday. Um, we have the next uh, actual board meetings, the 11th. Uh, so, we, I mean, maybe we can have a conversation about whether, how we feel about next week. Well, I know too, we're all meeting with you individually for budget meetings. We are doing that uh, Monday and Tuesday of next week. Um, I think we haven't scheduled Ginny's yet, but we'll get that scheduled. Maybe we have by now, but uh, yeah, right. Lori, you unmuted. Did you want to say something? No, okay. <laughs> I thought I'd call you out regardless. Thank you. Thanks to everybody for the hard work. I know this is a major undertaking. Clarissa, you really have your hands full right now between the two projects. I appreciate you taking it's that. It's so nice on. to meet you today. It's mm -hmm. nice to meet you all as well. I'm excited. It's a large undertaking, but I'm ready for it. We got to do it for the kids. Right. We're excited. And I would echo what Victoria is saying, just thanking everyone for all the work that's gone in over the summer and in the spring the district office staff, the building staff, our teachers, our, I mean, everybody, honestly. Um, you know, I was having a conversation earlier about, we have all these planning meetings and they are all kind of like, when you're done with the meetings, like, all right, let's, let's go at it, you know. In, and many years in my life, I've been a coach and I was kind of reminded, I, I never really used to have these meetings with the teams where when we're done with the meeting, everybody just kind of goes their own direction and kind of like, overwhelmed with the amount of work it's like we know we have a lot of work we're going to do a great job we're going to engage our kids our staff is tremendous our leaders in the district are tremendous our kids are tremendous and so this is just another challenge that we face as we continue to evolve what we do to support our kids and what Clarissa just said we do it for the kids that's what we've been saying all along we wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the kids so it's our responsibility to come up with the best plan and to enact that plan. So I, I appreciate all the work that's gone in. It's been a lot of hard work. Um, but tomorrow, you know, we're going to have to keep working at it. So I mean, it, it, it's just it's just as an ongoing thing. We work every day to get better at what we do. And so uh, I appreciate everyone. And I appreciate the board because you're right there with us all the way. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. We appreciate your time tonight.